Hello and welcome to this special broadcast where we focus on trade and all the issues preventing the smooth passage of goods and services across African borders. I'm Kenneth Igbomo. Now, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement is the tool to smoothen the process and help shore up the volumes of intra-African trade. But what barriers are holding back policymakers from making this Continental Trade Pact work for the average African? So far, as of, the June, as of June 2022, 54 African Union member states have signed the after AFCFT agreement. Uh, for three countries have deposited their instruments of ratification. The after continental free trade secretariat says 30 million Africans will potentially be lifted out of extreme poverty, and the continent will receive a $450 billion income boost by the year 2035. I recently met with the man driving this vision, Wam Kelimene, the Secretary General of the AFCFT Secretariat, and he gave me some insights on the progress of the trade pact and more. We have reached 88.7% rules of origin convergence. I think the last time you and I spoke uh, uh, on uh, uh, studio, uh, we were still moving towards uh, uh, that direction of making progress in rules of origin. We will now start trading on the basis of this 88.7%. And think about it this way. 4,500 products that we trade in Africa, imports and exports. Before this uh, convergence, we were trading based on uh, WTO rules. In other words, we were not giving one another preferences on all of these products. Now we have agreed on a single set of rules for all of these uh, products, 4,500. That to me is a very, very good start for us to uh, start trading. But of course, we depend on the member states. Um, and this is where the critical question is about when do we start? Every member state, every state party to the AFCFTA has to introduce in their uh, domestic market, they have to introduce the customs procedures uh, that are required to enable uh, uh, goods to come in and leave their territory under AFCFTA rules. And so I hope that uh, governments uh, and state parties uh, will accelerate this domestication of customs procedures so that we can see the goods transiting, transiting through the corridors from region to region on the basis of uh, AFCFTA preferences. Well, um, the starting point is what we heard uh, President El Sisi say this morning, and that is infrastructure development, uh, particularly infrastructure development that supports trade. We have seen the figures that um, Africa's in bank, the, the amounts that they have already invested in trade supporting infrastructure. We need more of that um, from both African Development Bank and Africa's in bank. Of course, African Development Bank in general as an institution that uh, provides uh, infrastructure support, but in particular, Africa's in Bank for trade finance, uh, trade supporting infrastructure. To me, that's the starting point. From our point of view, we have established the, the, um, the legal framework that is required uh, to trade uh, uh, under the AFCFTA rules and to enable the goods to transit through our borders uh, so we have, to, we have to do these things together. The, the trade liberalization in terms of rules and eliminating barriers as well as infrastructure development. That was Wam Kele, Menedi Secretary General of the AFCFTA Secretariat, giving us some upgrade on the progress of the trade pact. All right, for this discussion, I'm joined in studio by Sanyade Okoli, the CEO of Alpha African Advisory. Hello. And from Abuja, we have uh, Dr. Ken Okawa, the president of the National Association of Nigerian Traders. We also have from Abuja, Dr. Professor Ken Ife, the lead consultant for industry and private sector at the ECOWAS Commission. And from Côte d'Ivoire, we have Chema Triki. She's the industrialization lead at the Tony Blair Institute. Thank you all for taking time to join the discussion today. Let me first start with my guest in studio, uh, Sanya De Okoli. And uh, looking at where we are at currently with the with the, this trade pact, I'd like you to more or less speak on the pace of the progress we're seeing and the opportunity this trade pact presents for the continent. 
Okay, I think it's fair to say that some progress has been made, certainly even if we look at this year alone, with the, um, the payment system platform, PAPS, um, that was launched in January to enable, essentially facilitate payments across the continent for trade. And then there was the trade exchange that was launched um, more recently. Having said that, people would hope and expect it to move faster. But the question is, how realistic is that when you think of where each of these nations are um, in terms of infrastructure, logistics, et cetera, et cetera? All right, let me go to um, Dr. Ken Okoa here. And uh, I would like to understand, because you you're, you're speak to your members all the time, and I'd like to get a sense from you, the peculiarities that we see play out here in terms of moving goods across West African countries. Okay, Th thank you very much. Um, in terms of uh, issues uh, relating to, I mean, related to uh, what we see along the corridors, uh, within the cross-border transactions, um, I would say there are many. And uh, I'm going to uh, line out some of these based on what has been happening, especially with um, our experience at the ECOWAS regional level and, uh, you know, other uh, regions as well before the AFCFT kicks off. And of course, you've heard very well from uh, uh, Wankene that the real practical trading under the AFCFT has not really started in practice, I mean, in, in practical terms. Why? Because the rules of origin uh, negotiations are still going on. And of course, um, what has been accepted is about 88.7%, uh, like we heard. And then for about 4,500 products. But then we have almost about 6,200 tariff lines. So these issues are still going on. The negotiations are going on. However, as, to, as of today, what we see going on is, um, you know, one, the non-recognition of certificate of origin. And these are some of the things that we need to deal with within the context of the AFCFTA under the ETLS, under the extant uh, rules uh, or trade before the AFCFTA, we have a situation where many of the member states are not recognizing the certificate of origin. We need to deal with this. Number two is the multiplicity of checkpoints along the corridor. And this does not help trade at all. And all of these multiplicity of the, you know, the, you know, checkpoints have their menaces in terms of corrupt practices going on where, you know, traders, um, unsuspected traders uh, fall into the hands of, uh, you know, custom officials and other uh, border officials that milk them, you know. The next point is, um, you, know, the you know, the unnecessary delays along the corridors. And majority, in fact, major chunk of the goods that you find in the space within the region are perishable items. So you can, you know, guess, uh, you know, what happens in terms of such delays happening. And then you also see a situation where several documentations are required from the traders themselves. And I think that this is one lesson that AFCFTA would also need to learn. You know, stream, let's streamline documentations and understand also where we're coming from to the extent that, you know, practically, Majority of the traders in our African continent are semi literates. In fact, majority of them are literates, I mean, are illiterates, so to speak. And therefore, we need to, within the contemplation of the trade, uh, the, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the trade facilitation agreement of the WTO, also try as much as possible to streamline the documentations, the requirements, so that these people will understand. The next point I would need to mention is, you know, the kind of charges and taxes, you know, uh, that go on, the, you know, taxes and ch charges. I, I, I see a situation where, I mean, this is becoming a bit um, terrible to the extent that 
on transit goods. Charges are made. Taxes are being, you know, made to be paid on transit goods that are not destined. I mean, goods uh, uh, moving to the destination point. And um, I think we need to also look at the issues of smuggling. Oh. Smuggling essentially from third party. These are things that are critical that we need to deal with within the context of the EFCFT so that it does not spoil the good game that has started. It yeah, does definitely. not good spoil the good thing that we know have in mind. Thank you. Yeah, definitely quite a lot of uh, the points there made by Dr. Ken Kuawa here. Uh, and, uh, and I also resonate with that. And I'd like to also bring the other prof in the room as well here, Professor Ken, uh, and get a sense from you, uh, more or less your take on the progress we're seeing so far with this trade pack, 88.7% on rules of origin. Well, this, uh, we're making haste uh, slowly. And, um, and there are experiences, as Ken has started to point out, that needs to be taken on board. Um, I think we um, have been agreed on some a large proportion of the tariffs. We're now left with non-tariff barriers, and there are quite substantial non-tariff barriers that are playing out. And uh, we know that whilst it will cost you $2,500 to bring in a container into Tema, but when that container walks on the road to, to Lagos, it, you experience about $5,000 in, in, in payment of all sorts of things. And on the other hand, we hear the likes of Dan Gute saying that he cement he experiences 12 duty, uh, 12 uh, charges in uh, Benin and 17 in Togo and 11 in Ghana. And by the time his cement arrives in Ghana, it's 59% higher in, in price. It's, it's gone up by 59%, making him totally un uncompetitive. So you've seen those two sides. Of, of the movement along the transit corridor. It's very unfortunate that we continue to have this severe. But the one that is very worrying that actually stops the trade is the criminal enterprise, um, where we just refuse to play by the rules. And then you've seen where the likes of Nigeria, some other countries do shut down the borders because they feel that they've had enough of dumping off substandard goods that could be injurious to the health of the nation. Um, and things, goods dumped in such a way that they undermine the, the the, the 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 productive capacity of the country, and then you have drugs and small arms that are being heavily uh, moved across the borders illegally, and so so they are beginning to react to those because you've seen how the terrorism and terrorist activities are spreading and weakening governments across the region. So you don't blame them when they when when they just throw their hands in the air in desperation and then decide to shut down the border. I've always said to governments that shutting down border is not a long-term solution to any trade-related problem. Let me move to Cote d'Ivoire now and bring in Chema Tricky. Uh, Chema, uh, look, listening to all what has been said so far, we're talking about the progress of this of this trade pact here. I'd like you to speak specifically on what we see play out first on the global front that is affecting Africa here. We're seeing the war, the war uh, in, in, in Ukraine caused by Russia. And I'd like you to speak on more or less how that is impacting value chains across supply chain networks and how you, how you see that also uh, impact the kind of the amount of trade volumes we're seeing co coming to the continent thank you thank you for that question and and very glad to be uh, with you today um obviously the you know there are two crises that we had over the last two years right there was the COVID 19 crisis and now the ukraine uh, both has, have affected our economies in different ways, uh, but actually both could be an opportunity actually to, um, that we can benefit from. So the, the, the COVID-19 crisis has, has given us a big momentum as African to build our vaccine manufacturing capabilities. And there actually has been quite a significant improvement of that development of that value chain uh, over the last year. Um, there are a lot of challenges, there are a lot of, uh, the, the road is very bumpy, but there are quite uh, very interesting support from donors, from international community, and a quite strong leadership from, uh, from continental organizations like the African Union with the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing. And I think that the Ukraine crisis um, obviously has a lot of issues, put us under a big, a strong inflation and uh, is threatening our food systems. But it actually might provide us an opportunity to strengthen our thinking and our collaboration to develop, to develop our regional value chains. Like we develop the vaccine manufacturing, we should be very serious now about developing our competitiveness and our productive capabilities 
and our industries because frankly it's also the lack of our development uh, of or the lack of uh, uncompetitive and, and attractiveness of our industries that is an underlying condition that that led to uh, the very low levels of interregional trade in in the continent and i see that as, as as an opportunity i think the future belongs to optimists and i'm an optimist uh, and i think we need to see this as an opportunity for us to redirect our energy and our thinking and push our leaders yeah, to develop our capabilities. I can take a specific example. Uh, fertilizers, obviously, is one of the input that we, most of African countries, um, import from Ukraine or, or Russia. And actually, there are a number of producers of, of, of fertilizers on the continent, including in Morocco, and a number of other, whether nitrogen-based uh, um, uh, uh, fertilizers or phosphate-based fertilizers, that we actually can, could, add up, uh, could tap into and help build the cap capabilities of the those pockets of efficiencies that we find on the continent and focus on supplying from those rather than going to other external uh, external stakeholders. So I think this is a momentum and the AFCFTA brings us a strong momentum to build our self self sufficiency and to into and to look more within each other rather than looking to other partners uh, other trade partners. All right, I like that air of optimism there from Chema. Uh, let me come back to the studio here, Sonia Day, uh, listening to all what has been said so far. It begs a question. If we're going to make trade work for Africa, then the private sector has a huge role to play. I'd like you to speak to that, to that point there, the role of the private sector in galvanizing trade on the continent. Well, the reality is, in terms of trade with goods and services, it is coming from the private sector. But as you know, the private sector cannot operate in isolation. You do need governments to put in place the systems, the frameworks, etc., to enable the private sector to thrive. So if, for example, we're talking about you know, production, I think a key um, issue here today is the whole question of food security, for example, where we have seen the negative impact being dependent on other countries and other continents has had on um, the cost of food and therefore inflation and the general economic impact. But for you to be able to do food processing, for example, you need to have the necessary infrastructure. But having said that, I don't think that we are at a stage where we still need to be completely dependent on government for the infrastructure. Because you could have, for example, government producing, um, giving out guarantees. So you do have the private sector coming in and investing across the value chain. So not just at the manufacturing end, but even in terms of providing the enabling infrastructure. But you need the partnership with the government. You need the governments to be, to be willing to partner with private sector to enable us to work together to solve the issues, which are so obvious to, to us all. No, less that collaboration from government and, and private sector Absolutely. putting things together. Let me speak to uh, uh, Dr. Ken Ukwau here, here and uh, more or less get feedback from you in terms of what your members are seeing on the ground in terms of uh, uh, the challenges. Yes, you mentioned quite a lot on make, how, what challenges they're facing in making trade work. But speaking on the role of the private sector, uh, what role do you think they can play to make uh, to make uh, uh, your process is better. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think um, the private sector would need to see, first of all, see herself as a partner in progress in this entire process. And in doing that, the private sector must, you know, be also accommodated because I see one or two areas where the private sector has uh, been, you know, kept by the door. And uh, that's not going to be healthy for the AFCFD. Take, for instance, the, I have complained one or two times uh, that the under the AFCFTA, Article 20 talks about the dispute settlement mechanism. And uh, Article 21 talks about the, you know, uh, parties to date, this particular dispute settlement mechanism. And, you know, if you look at all the parties, you don't see the private sector as a, as a party. It only talks about member states as parties to the dispute settlement. And I ask myself, 
do member states do business? No. It is the private sector. It is the business people that do business. So, and in the process of the AFCAT implementation and all the transactions there, disputes are inevitable among the private sector entities and between private sector and governments. And take for instance, if I am shipping my goods from South Africa, for instance, and then coming to Nigeria, and I have an issue with uh, you know, the customs in South Africa, where do I go to? Do I have to wait for my government to raise the flag? Supposing the goods were, you know, uh, perishable items, do I have to wait until the government raises the flag and goes to the same dispute settlement? Where do I have to go to? Why don't I become a part and parcel of that so that I cannot be able to approach the dispute settlement mechanism for redress? And this is one thing that we're looking at. And of course, the AFCFT comes with investments. And therefore, within the context of investment architecture, I am also foreseeing a situation where the private sector also knocks at the door. And what do I mean? The private sector is the one that is bringing her investments, whether they are banks or transport or logistics or goods in terms of distributive goods and all of that. These are the private sector operators. And if, God forbid, we have issues like xenophobia, which we had a few years back, and it knocks at the door, what happens? It is the private sector's entity, I mean, investments that are going to crash. Therefore, we need to give this sector a place. Number two is the area of understanding the contents of the AFCFTA. And within that understanding, we also need to, you know, put this into two. One is understanding the contents within the contemplation of the rules on one side. And the other is understanding the, the contents within the contemplation of, you know, that this is a private sector that is the purveyor of the goods, and this is a government official, essentially the customs in this case, or any border official. Now, can we have the kind of public-private dialogues that will bring us to the table to say, look, this is a new dawn. So that when the ASCFTA practically comes in place in terms of its implementation, we can now shake hands together. We can shake hands as brothers, shake hands as colleagues in trade facilitation. We are not be, we're not going to be seen as enemies. These are areas I think that you know the private sector would need to be brought in. I think that the private sector is the investor, major investor in this business. And they are the ones that will either bear the brunt or become the beneficiaries, the utmost beneficiaries of the AFCFTA. And if we understand it from that angle, then this private sector must be given the key to open the doors. There are a few things that we have seen. And I think that in terms of you know what is happening right now, I mentioned earlier that within uh, you know the context of the ETLS here, uh, they say the the, the, the the test of the pudding is in the eating. If under the ETLS here, we are noticing that, you know, uh, transit goods are being charged, how do we address some of these things within the AFCFTA? How do we make sure that the private sector, who is the one paying these taxes, unwholesome taxes, these unknown taxes, are also, you know, so I mean, how do we arrange it in the way that they do not continue to suffer this loss? And again, for the private sector, I think we also need to educate ourselves the more in terms of what are the requirements for implementation of the AFCFTA. We need to be part and parcel of the implementation process, yes, but we need to educate ourselves on what are the requirements. What are the rules? What are the procedures? We need to come to terms with that. I, I, I give you an instance before I close here. And I, I see, take in Equus, for instance, my colleague, Professor uh, uh, Grife, talked about 
unilateral closure of borders. I, I, I was privileged to be a member of the, 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 the panel, the Equus Tech Task Force, that worked on this matter. And one of the recommendations that we had was that we saw heavy observation of you know, warehouses dotted along the borders, Nigeria, Benin Republic borders, and Nigeria, Niger borders. Warehouses along the borders. What are these warehouses doing? These are warehouses set up, established by, you know, smugglers. What, and we recommended that they should be crushed. What are they still doing there? If we do not do these things, if we don't take time to do, to remove these things, they will be carried over into the AFCFTA and we'll be having the same perennial problems. Right, Maybe I should stop here for now. Definitely Thank hard you. choices that need to be made to make trade work for the continent here. Let me bring in Professor Ken Ife here and still talking about the role of actors. Uh, one key major actor that, that, that has carried the weight of this, this trade pact are the development finance institutions. And I'd like you to speak to the, the role they are playing and how, how important it is to make trade work for Africa. Right, in 2011-2012, I was the United Kingdom DFID trade advisor to Nigerian government. And I was then you know, trying to push the country into trade facilitation agreement, the WTO trade facilitation agreement. And so I became very familiar with some of the flashpoints in, in, in facilitating trade within the country. And then you know that WTO did say that 10 to 15% of global trade is locked down in trade facilitation. So then, of course, I also focused on a regional approach to, to trade facilitation, which is my work in ECOWAS up to now. And then, of course, my work with World Bank and many other agencies. Now, in within that, World Bank did a study that said that if only 20% or $20 billion are going to be spent on fulfilling the missing links in regional infrastructure configuration, that that will bring additional 250 billion dollars in, in regional trade. Look at that quantum. From 20 billion, we'll bring another 250 billion in regional trade. So it tells you how the an appro a regional approach to uh, trade facilitation could actually um, empower the, the rest of the continent. Now, there are some models that I looked at with the work with Central uh, with World Bank and ECOWAS. I looked at authorized economic operator within the corridor and within the countries to show that it is feasible. And we looked at, looked at that, led the team from Nigeria to Cote d'Ivoire to show that within the country, if you do AEO mechanism, which is a preferential custom credit, and do a regional one, you will just open opportunities. I also also looked at um, other things like uh, the, 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 the transit corridor. I'm glad that ADB, African Development Bank, is putting, they're, they're getting some money to do that road because we use the EU to do that to show that that traffic from Lagos, Nigeria Seme border is the hottest traffic in the whole Africa. It has the you know it has the highest volume of economic trade in the whole region, in the whole the whole of African continent. So it was very important that we 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 focus on what benefit it could bring. And so we now brought joint border posts there, which EU funded, and joint border posts can help in many of the, the, the territorial, uh, because you can jointly man those, and Nigeria and Benin are doing that. So you need to have more joint border posts. We only have a few, only four were implemented under the EU budget, that uh, the, 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 the EDF 10. Then Ken mentioned the issue about uh, uh, non-recognition of certificate of origin. I actually went with the team to investigate in SEME border, to ask the custom, explain to me, why are you stopping these goods? And it became very clear that that particular case wasn't non-recognition, but it was a violation of the terms of the ETLS, that is the Ecowas Trade Liberation Scheme. Because under the scheme, you declare the value and quantity of the goods that you make. And so when they keep record of track of what you are pushing across the country and the code, but they're keeping a track, suddenly they will see that you are you declare 3,000 tons, as well, 3,000 uh, dozens as your capacity, but you've already, you are bringing in more than 10,000. So they will lead them to conclusion that it's no longer coming from your factory. It is an important thing you are just using. So these are some of the things that I picked up when I was interrogating the customs of some of those. So then we also have other things like um, C-Link, 
where we are trying to bring in three or four sheep to move goods from South Africa to Angola or across our coast, coastal line. Not only for the cabotage law to, to bring us on board on cabotage law, but actually to help move goods from one uh, corner to the other. Otherwise, if you want to ship something from Nigeria to Ghana, it has to go to Europe somewhere and then come back, and that could be months. So we, we got stuck on funding and some other issues, but, but those things are measures that could make the difference. Then, of course, there is the national and, uh, the national and regional single window. Now, many, many of the member states have actually implemented the national single window. Nigeria is still about to implement it. And you really need Nigeria to implement the national single window before we can implement the regional single window. And we know that regional single window would actually help because if goods are designated as transit goods and they began their journey by arriving in Ghana, and then, of course, the customs on the transit corridor will recognize those goods because they will appear on their manifest. So that will help mo moderate all these 100% um, search and all kinds of things. So but we're pressing Nigeria to do this. And uh, I have done that many times. I've talked to the minister. I've kept on since 2010. I've been you know, hammering on this. But I think um, we on budget now. We're trying to do that. But it's, it's, we need to close that loop so that you can have seamless transfer of goods across across the region. Yes, definitely. Minimal measures. Transfer of goods across oh. the region. Very, very important to get trade going there. Let me bring in Chema here, and uh, definitely we need to get all hands on deck. It's uh, something that we kind of all agree on. And uh, I'm like trying to look at how we can leverage on strategic partnerships uh, to more or less drive trade, and what role industrialization uh, and our industrialization agenda could play in all of this. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I think industrialization is at the heart of, of, of these questions, right? We cannot talk about trade without talking, what are we trading? <laughs> what, what are we trading and what are we, you know, whether in goods or services, right? There isn't only manufacturing, there are also a number of services with the mobility of people that we need to, uh, that we could uh, facilitate. So I, I see that those, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy that the AFCFTA Secretariat actually takes that perspective on, on, on the trade uh, agreement that we have. It is a tool to help African government, uh, African countries develop regional value chains and develop industries together. And there isn't any trade without industrialization and without developing uh, our industries. So the solutions there are, are, are obviously not, not straightforward. Um, there isn't a silver bullet point that we, and there aren't shortcuts. We need to reform our business environment. Uh, we need to build uh, effective industrial blocks. But if we, if we talk about the, the solutions to trade, there are three layers that I see there. There is obviously first building competitive industries and that could touch on the cost of capital that is the most uh, that is the most binding, that is the binding constraint for lo our local SMEs. And that's why one of the reasons that we cannot compete with international, uh, with international actors, there are the skills that we need to bring uh, uh, on board or to build these industries, the technology transfer, because frankly, we, we are not at the top of, uh, of the technologies in the world. Um, and so all of these would help us build the industries and then build our infrastructure, right? To be able to move these goods, um, in an effective way. We know that the infrastructure today, about 80 to 90% of the freight in Africa is actually through roads, while we have uh, the lowest road in the world. Uh, we, have, we have railway systems that are actually from colonial legacy and that are have been developed in a, in a sort of philosophy of exploitation and not a philosophy of transformation, which we need to shy away from. Most of the, most of the goods that we are transporting today are commodities that basically either we export commodities to other external actors uh, or we import finished goods uh, that we consume, but there is very little transformation uh, of, of these goods. So this is, these are the, this is the momentum that we need to seize to be able to collaborate. Um, and I know this is a difficult uh, thing, but th there is no other way for us to develop in a win-win uh, situation without collaboration and without thinking uh, intentionally about what is the design of our value chain and what what do we where, where can we specialize each one of us and how can we complement each other rather than compete with each other um, so I think this is a fundamental point uh, to, to be able to solve the 
the heart of trade, which is what are you trading and what goods are you? What is the level of complexity of these goods that you're trading? And where is the level of competitiveness of your industry? And maybe to reflect to, to because it's always good to look at other, other um, regions experiences. If we look to the Asian experience, Vietnam is a success story that everyone talks about um, that has developed quite successfully over the last 20 years and industrialized. But Vietnam has, um, you know, has benefited from a regional dynamic. Vietnam would have not been Vietnam without giants like South Korea, Japan, China, and without their, their, the level of interregional trade that they have. 58% of their trade, of Asian trade, is within Asia. And so I think these are important points for us to reflect on and to seize this opportunity uh, to develop regional value chains in a complementary and symbiotic way. Well put there, Tema. Definitely the, on the area of developing trade infrastructure partnerships can go a long way to quicken the process. And let's hear what the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, Eno Ebong, has to say about how the AFCFTA fits into their agenda and the opportunities for synergy. Let me start by saying that the mission of U.S. Trade and Development Agency is to develop high quality, sustainable infrastructure for trade using US technologies, goods and services. Our mission includes helping our overseas partners develop the infrastructure for trade, which is essential to the long-term economic competitiveness for the region. Let's think about the essential needs for doing business, reliable electricity, internet connectivity and transportation infrastructure. These are some of the main sectors where USTDA operates across Africa. And I believe that these are the main opportunities for Synergy to help Africa's businesses benefit from the arrangements like the African continental free trade area. USTDA works with Africa's public and private sectors, and we provide grant funding to help them structure bankable infrastructure deals that can attract financing, be implemented and sustained. And we also support activities to build business partnerships with US companies that can deliver the kind of innovative infrastructure solutions that Africa will welcome. In emerging economies around the world, one of the biggest constraints to developing infrastructure for trade is the lack of funding for project preparation and partnership building activities. In this respect, the U.S. Trade and Development Agency helps to fill an important trade and development gap for Africa. And that was Eno Ebong, uh, the director of the U.S. Trade and Development Agency, there giving us a, 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 a sense of what is playing out and how they can partner to make the AFCFTA work for Africans. Let me come back to the studio here and with Sanya Day. And Sanya Day, um, listen to what everybody has said so far. And I'd like you to speak to the importance of those partnerships to plug these infrastructure gaps that we're seeing to boost our trade. Okay. I think to situate my response, I'm going to tell you a personal story. The first time I was actually at this studio was in 2018. After I had, you know, when you had the mudslides in Sierra Leone, I'm actually Sierra Leonean and I had launched a humanitarian effort here in Nigeria and got a whole lot of goods, you know, from food and clothes, et cetera, et cetera. And I was here in the studio talking about the challenges I had getting those um, donations over to Sierra Leone. And all I can say is that the food, thanks um, to Medview, they actually airlifted um, the food within short order. So within a, a week or so, you actually had the food, but everything else, the clothes, the um, toiletries, et cetera, et cetera. First of all, you had the bureaucracy of making sure you had the permits to take it from Nigeria, even though it was a donation from Nigeria to um, Sierra Leone. Then you had all the logistics issues, and then you had to get it by ship. By the time it got to Sierra Leone, elections had taken place and you had a new government. And those goods were stuck. And it took pushing and pushing and pushing. And I kid you not, it took, it was almost two years to the date of the mudslides 
that the rest of the goods got into the hands of the beneficiaries. And I think that for me speaks to the importance of having something like this agreement work and to work effectively. But if you ask me what the key issue is with the trade in um, um, trade and movement of goods in Africa, I think over and above infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, I think it's people. I think we actually are the impediment and our mindsets are the impediment where people need to understand the importance that we talk about customs, et cetera. They need to understand the importance of having something like this work and they need to understand the benefit that it has, not just for the collective, but also for the individual. Because let's call a spade a spade. You and I know that part of the issues we really face are the gatekeepers right across the different countries. I can't remember another panelist spoke about, I think, Dangote, who's talking about all the different tariffs. You and I know that you've got the official tariffs, the unofficial tariffs, and they're simply gatekeepers. And gatekeepers that are looking to meet their needs today. But we need to have broader education and awareness for everybody. We, we are all stakeholders, not just government or private sectors or the consumers. We're all stakeholders and we need to understand that the individual choices we make would determine how effective this agreement is, but we need this agreement. If COVID didn't show us anything, it showed us that we can't be completely dependent on the rest of the world, and we have to be able to meet our own needs, but not just as an individual countries, but as the continent where we can move goods. You know, I think Chema was talking about, you know, the um, vaccine, um, manufacturing that is, you know, being launched in Rwanda and different places. We need to get those vaccines, not just to other East African countries, but across to West Africa and Southern Africa, etc. We have to make this work, but it really boils down to each and every one of us making the right choices at the right time. All right, very well said there, uh, making the right choices at the right time. And I'm still on this issue of infrastructure, and I would like uh, uh, Dr. Ker Dokoa to speak to First, the state of the current infrastructure we are we're seeing play out and how you would like to see this being uh, developed going forward in terms of models and even partnerships. Okay, um, <clears throat> I think one of the mistakes we have made before now is um, uh, total dependence on government to provide infrastructure. And when I mean dependence on government, I mean, government uh, putting infrastructure, every infrastructure on national budget. And that weighs down other sectors. Our budgets are limited. And for God's sake, I, I think that the private sector is, I mean, this is another area where private sector should also be given opportunity. There are infrastructure, cadres of infrastructure, various cadres, various streams of infrastructure that the private sector can be able to provide. So as to free governments from, I mean, funds to run government and run the people and run the social systems and, you know, reduce poverty within the system. So, but this is not so within our culture, unfortunately. I think that within the contemplation of the FCFT, we need to start learning that look, there are opportunities. The private sector would need to come in, but it goes with some level of, uh, if you like, um, funding, funding from the private sector, but then trust and confidence, negotiations government would need to come up to negotiate with the private sector, be ready to release part of the infrastructure, to build or to establish. And we know what we call a BOT, build, operate, and transfer. These things can come in so that the private sector, within that context, private sector will, uh, will build, will construct, will establish. I will also make some gains, but in that process will also build employment generation in a huge manner. 
And that's the way it would trickle down to the to impacting very, very seriously, very enormously on the economy. I'd like to pick that up with Professor Ket Ife here in terms of what we're doing to build capacity and get this message of the AFCFCA trickle down to the grassroots. So it's not just only among policy policymakers, but that the key the core message is being passed down to women, to the young people on how on their on how they can take advantage of this trade pact. Well, the well, you notice that Nigeria didn't sign for one year because they needed to go back and educate the people and explain to them what the hell is going on. And especially the manufacturers wanted to know if they are going to be stitched up. And then afterwards, the communication strategy began to be developed. So I think um, uh, member states have quite some substantial work to do to carry their private sector along. And that is why every member state has guidance from uh, UNECA on developing their AFCTA strategy. And incidentally, I'm also involved in developing the regional strategy for AFCTA, so, so in that respect. Um, but I need to also commend the development partners because the development partners are very, very, they're actually so, they are preaching to the converted on the efficacy of PPPs. We, in ECO, as we have uh, over seven years ago, we developed our regional policy on PPP and we are moving down the lane, uh, in, you know. So they are actually created infrastructure project preparation facility. See, the uh, World Bank has it, Africa Development Bank has it, our own aid bid, which is ECOWAS Bank for Industrial Development has it. So they are using that to encourage the private sector to do development, or research and development work around public infrastructure. Because it's difficult to tell a private sector to come and spend $1 million preparing a, a, a big plan for infrastructure that is in the domain of government. And then only for somebody to tell you, oh, I'm sorry, we can't fund this. And then it's a, it's a lot of waste for them. So by that, in that respect, they, they're really encouraging this. And then I also think that there are uh, some good examples that have to be continued and extended. For example, the Ramu uh, corridor, you know, the the Mombasa, you have this uh, rail corridor that is heading down to Cameroon. If only it could connect to Nigeria, then it could now go all the way to Senegal. So that can be con concluded, that can be you know extended. We also have the Chad, which is a big water infrastructure that has almost gone down to 10% of its volume. Uh, and you can see the economy there, they displace all the economy uh, in that region. Let me bring in Chema here, because I want her to speak around export diversification and you know, um, countries taking advantage of their, uh, the, 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 the food crops that are best to them, and more or less uh, um, the progress we're seeing from countries, and also pick up on the point around women and youths and how they can all play in that export diversification agenda. Great, so, so that, that basically we, we export, we, we diverse our exports by, by developing different industries, right? And you start, there is no, again, in development, unfortunately, there is no shortcut. You have to kind of follow different steps that, that kind of get you in the development ladder. So obviously the first step is um, to develop industries that uh, you know can absorb the labor, the, the huge labor force that we have in, in our countries. Uh, we're working, for instance, at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, we're working with uh, the government of Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and Togo to develop the textiles uh, and, uh, and the apparel industry. You know how much the apparel industry, the apparel segment can actually create a number of uh, uh, jobs at scale. Um, and then the, tech, the textiles industry represent those backward linkages that you want to see in industrialization because it's a heavy, uh, it's a technological heavy uh, segment that, that adds up to 400% if you transform cotton from its raw form and to, 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 to fabric, you add about 400% of value, uh, value addition in, in your, the economy. So those are the, uh, th then there are a number of sectors that you can look at uh, uh, by, by analyzing the position of a country on the product map uh, and understanding what are the closed 
basically the close uh, the nearby products that you can enter and upgrade your technological uh, know-how in and your sophistication and your capabilities um, and building up slowly until you basically like a country like Vietnam uh, you know diversified into electronics into uh, our leaders into electronics in apparel uh, textiles uh, in, in automotive and a number of the of other industries that um, that they have managed to develop again, benefiting from a regional dynamic, and that's why I think uh, help supporting having regional, uh, basically uh, regional champions that can have spillover effects, positive spillover effects on other countries is really important in the continent. Uh, but I want to come back also, uh, if you don't mind, on the question of, of, of uh, the inefficient systems that we have in trade, right? Because obviously producing the goods and importing in, uh, diversifying our exports and moving away from the model of exporting only commodities to exporting more technological intensive uh, products that can help us catch up technologically would not would need also to be um, coupled by an improvement in the in the systems uh, of trade and logistics and I think there there is a number there is a really huge opportunity for technology to play, right? Uh, if we can, uh, anything that could be digitalized and automated should be. And frankly, that can reduce our many problems that we see at customs, even for them to be able to understand the customs authority, to be able to understand which product can benefit from the preferential treatment or not uh, on the, of the FCFTA. There are a number of digital tools and automated tools that we can think about and, and display in different, uh, in different Different parts of the of the continent. Um, there is a system, for instance, uh, Rwanda. If I can bring some examples, Rwanda has put in place a digital single window platform that reduced the clearance day, the clearance days uh, at customs from 11 days to 10 hours. Right. So there are there are huge opportunities that we can we can look at. Uh, again, if we take if I come back to an example of West African country, uh, Togo. We've seen during the COVID-19 how Togo has played a, a big role into developing. Uh, basically was one of the first countries to develop a digital system for for travel passes right um which helped obviously the mobility not of goods but of people uh, this time so i think there is there is an opportunity for us to think strategically and for the policymakers and our governments to play a strategic role into how we can solve the issues at different layers First, create the industry because that's what's going to help the competitiveness as for diversification improve the trade and build the infrastructure and shy away from building rails because those have rails have obviously very good social uh, spillovers and good social returns right um, they, and and they represent the public and they might also help in in solving the tell that we might see in uh, some countries um, by private and all the all the transport systems and then building and help and then finally solving the question of systems by helping by digitalizing when we can and use uh, the solutions that exist today by technology harnessing that power to be able to optimize our system and our logistics so i just want to conclude this by saying there are only solutions right and we should all be problem solvers and work on day-to-day -day basis with the vision of developing our 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 um our continent and again the future belongs to the optimist so let's all be optimist about it all right they're very thank you so much uh, for that summation of, i'm afraid time is fast spent and it brings us to the end of the exciting discussion on how to break down the barriers to cross-border trade in West Africa. I'm Kenneth Bomo, and a big thanks again to my guest, Sayade Okoli, the CEO of Afa African Advisory, uh, Dr. Ken Ukwawa, the president of the National Association of Nigerian Traders, uh, Professor Ken Ife, the lead consultant for industry and private sector at the ECOWAS Commission. And, and last but not the least, Chema Triki, the industrialization lead at the Tony Blair Institute. We leave you with the closing remarks from Edwin Ikora, the Africa director of the One Campaign. Thanks for watching. My name is Edwin Ikwaria. I'm the Africa Executive Director of the One Campaign. As the conversation has been ongoing, there is, not, there is no better time to think about how to exactly make the AFCFTA work. Because when we think about all of the barriers to trading within the sub-region, and we think about the potential that is CFTA holds in really creating and unlocking the sectors in the African economy that will really create jobs. And we think about the opportunity that it will create for young people. 
when we think about the enormous potential to really increase productivity and really put Africa in the map of, uh, as a major trader, then we have to do all we can to make the CFTA work. We have to eliminate all the red tapes in cross-border trade. We have to really simplify the complex procedures. We have to really make sure that the process are transparent and corruption-free. We have to do all we can to reduce the transaction costs in terms of trade, in terms of time, in terms of mod, uh, 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 um, finance. But in fact, if we do not do all of this, Africa will continue to remain at the back of the process when global trade is concerned. But beyond global trade, even when things like the pandemic occurs, what we saw during the course of the pandemic is that when countries closed their borders, Africa was left to fend for itself. Unless we get it right, we will continue to remain at the back of the queue because every country is looking for its own interests. And we have to do all we can to make sure it works. Now, stakeholders, wherever we are, have to do, have to comply, have to do what we call the policy convergence so that the different trading regimes in different countries actually converge to have a simple, simplified process. And Africans can really trade with, its, with itself. Indeed, we've been talking about an, a, an African union, not longer an African union at the political level. It has to come to be an African union at the level of citizens. And that can only be done when the borders are open and trade can really flow. That is my biggest call today. And I think if we really have to, uh, if we really have to create jobs, if we really have to uh, uh, find opportunities for the 15 million young people who are coming into the job market every day, every year on this continent, then this is the time to do what, it needs, what we need to do to put us on the map for trade. The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is um, quite unique and has created uh, the largest free market area on the globe. And for it to really realize the kind of job creation and revenue generation that we know that it can, I think it's two key words, entrepreneurship and infrastructure. So entrepreneurship in the sense that it is the small and medium enterprises who will conduct the trade across Africa that will catalyze the growth and the job creation that we want to see. However, these entrepreneurs need infrastructure. Unfortunately, right now, it was easier to trade within Africa in the pre-colonial days than it is today, and that should not be. So our governments need to work hand in hand with private sector to build a strong and solid infrastructure so that young entrepreneurs can have an easy, not just free, yes, we know access is free uh, uh, with the AFCTA, but it should be easy and convenient and less expensive than taking your goods to Europe. So what we need is roads, we need railways, and we need to mandate you know, ships that who come from the West, bring in goods, to take, those, take goods from Africa into other African countries before they leave. So once we can get the infrastructure right, leave the rest to the entrepreneurs. We at the Tony El Mello Foundation have seen how remarkably innovative African entrepreneurs are. They have come to us with some of them just ideas. And with the training and mentoring we give them, coupled with a seed capital funding of $5,000, many of these entrepreneurs have gone on to build impressive businesses that is creating jobs and generating revenue in their communities. To date, we've trained and funded over 15,000 young African entrepreneurs. These are the foot soldiers. They are the ones that will make the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement not just a living reality, but the greatest policy transformation that's happened to Africa by trading with one another, generating revenue. But we need to do our part as government and the private sector to ensure the free movement of goods and the easy and cheap movement of goods across African countries. With these two things, I believe that the AFCTA will, will, will increase uh, the economic dividend uh, for our burgeoning youth population across the African continent.